our next discussion will be all about tubular reabsorption. But before we do, let's look at my drawing on the upper right hand corner. Where I've drawn a tubule cell, in this particular case, it's a simple cuboidal cell. Remember that the entire length of the renal tubules, the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop, and as well as the distal convoluted tubule are all simple epithelial tissue. So this is a representation of a simple cuboidal cell with many microvilli. The part of the cell that is in direct contact with the filtrate is referred to as the apical surface. And of course, we find this filtrate in the lumen of our renal tubules. Then we have the lateral surface, and finally the basal surface in which the epithelial cell is anchored to the basement membrane. And directly deep to the basement membrane will be another fluid called the interstitial fluid. So this is the fluid that is between the simple cuboidal epithelial cell and the blood vessel. Now before I forget, sometimes we can combine the lateral and the basal surface into what's called the basolateral. Now a tight junction is what we find between these simple epithelial cells. And the purpose of these tight junctions is, is to prevent the filtrate, once again found in the lumen of the renal tubule, to pass in between the cells. Now you'll see later that in certain parts of the renal tubule, the tight junctions aren't so tight. Instead, they're on the leaky side, which means now it's possible for components found within the filtrate to actually go in between the cells, which now leads me into the routes of reabsorption of substances. So the first way to reabsorb the substances whereby we take solutes found in filtrate and bring them back into blood. So one way is through transcellular route or transcellular transport. You may also see it as transcellular reabsorption. Whatever the case may be, transcellular means through the cell. So the substance will enter the apical surface then pass through the cytosol of the cell, and then make an exit through the basal lateral membrane. More often than not, it'll be through the basal surface. And then they enter the interstitial fluid. From there, they now enter blood through the endothelium of the peritubular capillaries. Now keep in mind, the peritubular capillaries are what will surround the PCT, the short nephron loops of the cortical nephrons, and the distal convoluted tubule, the DCT. So there's two ways to enter the cell transcellularly or transcellular reabsorption. One way is to freely cross the plasma membrane and then through the cell and then exit at the basal surface or basal membrane of the cell. Substances that are hydrophobic so think lipids that are nonpolar can easily cross the plasma membrane, enter the cytosol, leave the cell, and enter blood by passing through the endothelial cell, the tunica intima. However, if we're looking at a hydrophilic substance, polar substances, or charged particles like ions, they cannot freely enter or leave the cell. Instead, the only way to enter the cell through the apical side, because they are in filtrate, is through some type of channel or carrier. Now, these channels and carriers are transmembrane proteins. And then once inside the cytosol of the cell, they now can leave the cell through another carrier or channel protein so that it will enter the interstitial fluid and then eventually find its way into blood. Before we begin looking at these two images, let's just review the extracellular fluids that we've covered so far. We've talked about the interstitial fluid, the fluid that surrounds our cells. We have plasma, the fluid component of blood. We talked about lymph that's found in our lymphatic vessels. And 
we have our filtrate. The filtrate that is produced through the process of glomerular filtration that ends up in the capsular space of the glomerular capsule. We also have the interstitial fluid, IFC, which is the cytosol, the fluid that we find inside our cells. So this image over here, I really like because not only in the way it's illustrated, but as well as how these structures are clearly labeled. Here we have our capsular space that found within the Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. And here is filtrate, the product of glomerular filtration. And this filtrate will immediately flow into the first component of the renal tubules, which is the PCT, or the proximal convoluted tubule. Now in this image, it's giving us the tubular fluid, but we'll stick to calling it filtrate. Remember, ultimately, this filtrate will become urine. Now if we look at the epithelial cells that line the proximal convoluted tubule, they're simple cuboidal cells, and they have many microvilli. And the fluid that we find between the nephron and as well as the blood vessel, in this case the peritubular capillary, is the interstitial fluid. And of course within the peritubular capillary will be our blood. So as the filtrate is making its way through the PCT, we are going to have transport, meaning we're going to move substances, either we're going to reabsorb them or we're going to secrete them. Don't forget, when we say reabsorption, we're taking certain things in filtrate and sending them back into blood. While with secretion, we're going in the opposite direction, where we have certain solutes in blood that will be sent into the lumen of our renal tubules. And now, of course, that will become part of filtrate. So here is our paracellular transport that we just talked about. And this is transport that is occurring between the simple epithelial cells. And then if we look over here, we have the transcellular transport, where the movement of substances is occurring across the epithelial cell. Part of the epithelial cell that is in contact with the filtrate, in other words, their microvilli, is the apical surface or the apical membrane while the basal lateral consists of the lateral surface and the basal surface, which is in contact with the basement membrane. Now, going back to transcellular transport, we will have transmembrane proteins involved, especially if we're looking at hydrophilic substances, such as polar compounds like glucose and ions such as sodium. So these transport proteins, once again, are transmembrane proteins, as you can see, are inserted in the plasma membrane of the apical membrane or the apical side of the simple cuboidal cell. And we also will find them in the basal lateral side, in this case, the basal surface or basal membrane of the simple cuboidal cell. And this is the only way we are going to move hydrophilic substances if we are reabsorbing them transcellularly, in other words, through the cell. However, if the solute is hydrophobic, such as a lipid compound, they will not need these transport proteins. A hydrophobic substance can freely cross the plasma membrane at both the apical and the basal lateral. While the bottom picture here once again is the filtrate in the lumen of the tubule, the cytosol, the interstitial fluid, and of course, the blood found in this case in the peritubular capillary. Let's now discuss the mechanisms for reabsorption and secretion of substances. So understanding these mechanisms are very important, especially when we look at reabsorption and secretion as the filtrate is making its way through these renal tubules and eventually entering into the collecting tubule and the collecting duct. So the first mechanism is secondary active transport. Symport, also called co-transport, and antiport, also called counter-transport. For this to work, we are also going to need transmembrane proteins that we refer to as porters. So when it comes to symport or co-transport, we're going to use a porter called symporter. 
And when it comes to anti-port or counter-transport, that porter is called an anti-porter. The bottom line, whether it's symporter or anti-porter, there's still transmembrane proteins that we can find both at the apical membrane and the basal lateral membrane. The second type of mechanism is diffusion, which is a completely passive transport or a completely passive process because no energy needs to be expended. We do not need ATP. Why? Because these substances are following their concentration gradient. They're moving from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. So the first type of diffusion is osmosis, which for all intents and purposes is the diffusion of water. Water is moving along its concentration gradient. Now water is very polar. It is very hard for this polar molecule to cross the plasma membrane because of the phospholipid bilayer. Therefore, to make this more efficient and more likely to occur, we're going to need aquaporins, a transmembrane protein. So having aquaporins, water now can freely diffuse. We have what's called obligatory water reabsorption versus facultative water reabsorption. So let's first look at obligatory water reabsorption. This means that aquaporins will always be there. We find this in the PCT and the descending limb of the nephron loop. Don't forget, these aquaporins can be found in the apical side or the apical membrane and the basal lateral membrane. Whereas facultative water reabsorption, the only time aquaporins will be present is if antidiuretic hormone is there. Otherwise, without this hormone, we will not have these aquaporins. So where exactly will these aquaporins now appear if we have this hormone? Well, we're going to find them in the late distal convoluted tubule, the collecting tubule, as well as the collecting duct. So what I've done is I've inserted this drawing that I made, and the arrows are showing the flow of filtrate. And notice I have two areas. One is colored in green, and the other is colored in blue. So the area that's colored in green is obligatory water reabsorption, meaning we will have aquaporins that are present both on the apical and the basolateral membrane regardless if a hormone is there or not. That is what it means to be obligatory. Whereas with facultative reabsorption, we will only find aquaporins if antidiuretic hormone is being secreted. Otherwise, there will not be any aquaporins. This is what it means to be facultative. Another type of diffusion is facilitated diffusion. This involves some type of transmembrane proteins allowing hydrophilic substances such as polar compounds and ions to diffuse. They cannot freely cross a plasma membrane because we have that hydrophobic layer. So they're going to need some help. That's why it's called facilitated. So these transmembrane proteins are your leakage channels and your carrier proteins. The last type of diffusion is just simply called simple diffusion, meaning we do not involve any transmembrane proteins. These substances can just freely diffuse. A good example of substances that can freely cross a plasma membrane will be our lipid-soluble substances, our hydrophobic, nonpolar solutes. So these solutes can just cross the plasma membrane they do not need leakage channels, and they do not need carrier proteins. We can also have diffusion of ions, but this can only happen if they are diffusing between the cells, paracellularly. Because if they are diffusing transcellularly, then we're going to need some help. We are going to need some transporters or transmembrane proteins, such as leakage channels or carrier proteins. The last mechanism will be active transport. 
So active transport, we need energy in the form of ATP. Why? It is because, unlike diffusion, we are now going against the concentration gradient, meaning substances are being moved from low to high. Now, the type of transmembrane protein is referred to as an ATPase pump. The fact that ATPase is there means that there is a built-in enzyme that will hydrolyze ATP so we can get the energy out of ATP so we can move the substances against its concentration gradient. And if you see the word pump, it automatically means active transport. If we look at the image over here, we can see passive transport, in other words, diffusion. And here is simple diffusion. This is a hydrophobic substance, nonpolar, lipid soluble, freely crossing the plasma membrane without any help at all. Whereas with facilitated diffusion, we're going to need a transporter, leakage channels, carrier proteins. Bottom line, these substances are charged or they're polar, they're hydrophilic. And then over here with active transport, this right here is a pump. And notice how ATP is involved for energy because we're moving substances against its concentration gradient from low to high. Now, before we wrap up this slide, I want to revisit the secondary active transport. The way I like to describe secondary active transport is that it is a combination of both diffusion and active transport built into one porter, whether it's a sim porter or an anti porter, it doesn't matter. So, how exactly does this work? So, let's first consider this right here, okay? And we have two substances substance A and substance B. And this round thing represents the cell, okay? And right over here is a porter. Based on my arrows, I hope you see that we're gonna have a higher concentration of A outside of the cell versus what we have inside the cell. Now the opposite is true for substance B. We will have less substance B or less concentration of substance B outside of the cell Whereas inside the cell, we're going to have a higher concentration of substance B. So what we're going to do is we're going to diffuse substance A, meaning A will follow its concentration gradient. It is entering the cell. So this is your typical facilitated diffusion. It is moving along its concentration gradient. Now, as it's diffusing, it's gonna pull substance B and force it to move against its concentration gradient. This is active transport. This is why I like to refer to secondary active transport as a mix of both diffusion and active transport. It's a hybrid type of transporting. Now, the fact that these arrows are pointing in the same direction, meaning pointing into the cell, this is specifically called symport, also called co-transport. And this porter is a sim porter. Down below, this time we're considering two different substances, substance C and substance D. Now in this scenario, we are going to have a lower concentration of substance C outside of the cell versus a higher concentration of substance C inside the cell. And this also will apply to substance D. We have less of substance D outside of the cell and more of substance D inside the cell. Let's first look at diffusion, okay? So we're moving substance C from an area of high concentration, which is inside the cell, allowing it to diffuse outside of the cell. Once again, this is diffusion. Now, as C is diffusing from high to low, it's gonna force D, which we have a lower concentration of outside into the cell, meaning we're forcing it from low to high. This is the active transport part. Now, because these arrows are pointing in two different directions, this type of secondary active transport is called antiport, also called counter transport. 
And this transmembrane protein, this porter is called an antiporter. And this is secondary active transport. So before you move on to the next slide, just carefully look at this image and look at the various transcellular proteins that we find both apically and basolaterally.